Um, as Kaylan already said, so our first speaker will be um, Steve Grosberg, who is already here as one of the panelists. And he has been a pioneer in so many topics which are relevant for us for learning and forgetting. So I am very, very excited to hear what he has to say. And, and Steve, I don't know if you would like to give a short introduction. So I know Steve has been kind enough to prepare a video to make sure that we can also upload this in good quality. If you would like to give a short introduction of your work, that would be fantastic. Well, I'm very happy to be able to join you today. My understanding is that you'll be playing a pre-recorded video that will last about 45 minutes, and then I'll have 15 minutes of a live Q&A. So I better just shut up and get you going with the video because there's only an hour. So go for it. Exactly, wonderful. And everybody, please just put your questions in the Q&A chat and uh, we will address them in the remaining 15 minutes of the session. Okay, then I will start playing the video. Hello, I'm delighted to be able to speak to you today about a topic concerning artificial intelligence, which as you know, it's very much in the news these days. And I'll be contrasting two very different approaches to artificial intelligence. But to do that, I need to pull up my PowerPoint slides and share them with you. And let me maximize them and minimize my face. So my topic today is explainable and reliable AI comparing deep learning with adaptive resonance. This lecture is based on the following article from this year, which is both open access and on my webpage. The article summarizes core problems of deep learning, such as its untrustworthiness because it's unexplainable and its unreliability because it experiences catastrophic forgetting. The article explains how adaptive resonance overcomes these problems, indeed overcomes 17 problems of deep learning and outlines a blueprint for achieving autonomous adaptive intelligence. The article is part of a Frontiers in Neurobotics special issue about explainable AI, whose editors wrote, and I quote, though deep learning is the main pillar of current AI techniques and is ubiquitous in basic science and real world applications, it is also flagged by AI researchers for its black box problem. It is easy to fool and it also cannot explain how it makes a prediction or decision. In other words, deep learning is not trustworthy. No life or death decision, such as a medical or financial decision, can confidently be made based upon a deep learning prediction. Deep learning uses the back propagation algorithm for learning how to predict output vectors in response to input vectors. Back propagation was based on perceptron learning principles that Frank Rosenblatt started to introduce in the 1950s. It has a complicated history, which Jürgen Schmidt-Huber beautifully reviewed in an article from this year. Major contributors include Shinichi Amari, Paul Werbos, and David Parker. Perhaps one would say that it reached its modern form with simulated applications in Paul's 1974 paper before being popularized 12 years later by Rommel Hart Hinton and Williams. Here's a schematic of a backpropagation circuit reprinted from a survey article by Gail Carpenter of Neural Network Models. In it, information flows feed forward from an input stage to an output stage. Learning is supervised by an external teacher who on each trial defines a target or desired output. 
the teaching signal is the error or mismatch between the actual and the target outputs. The teaching signal in level F3 of adaptive weights in level F2 have no network pathway whereby to reach from F3 to F2 within the algorithm. So the algorithm uses an artifice called weight transport, which physically lifts the weights from here and moves them there so that they can be used to control learning. Well, this is clearly a non-local operation <coughs> as well as being clearly non-biological. Backpropagation learns through slow learning, which means that the adaptive weights change just a little to reduce error on each learning trial. That requires many trials, that is to say many repetitions of the whole database to learn, possibly hundreds or thousands of trials. This is to be contrasted with fast learning, where adaptive weights zero error signals on each trial, just as we can learn a face that we see just once and remember it for a long time. If Backprop tried to use fast learning, it would become wildly unstable. Catastrophic forgetting also occurs in Backprop so that during any learning trial, an unpredictable part of its learned memory can unexpectedly collapse. So deep learning, which is based on backpropagation, is thus neither reliable nor trustworthy. But why is this? One reason is that all inputs are processed by a shared set of learned weights. The algorithm cannot selectively buffer learned weights that are still predictively useful. In particular, there's no attention mechanism. This problem occurs in any learning algorithm whose shared weight updates follow the gradient of the error in response to the current batch of data points while ignoring past batches. There have been multiple efforts to fix backpropagation. One is to selectively slow learning on the weights important for learning by optimizing parameters using the Bayes rule, as Kirkpatrick et al suggested a few years ago. But that assumes an omniscient observer who can discover and alter uh, the important weights, as well as non-local computations such as the Bayesian computation. The same problem occurs with evolutionary algorithms and diffusion-based neuromodulation and other approaches to try to fix backdrop. These efforts to overcome catastrophic forgetting created additional conceptual and computational problems. I view them as adding epicycles to ameliorate a fundamental flaw in the model, which to me is reminiscent of adding epicycles to correct problems in the Ptolemaic model of the solar system. As we all know, the Copernican model that we now accept didn't require epicycles. Perhaps this is why Jeffrey Hinton, who played a key role in developing both backprop and deep learning, said in an Axios interview a few years ago that, quote, he's deeply suspicious of backpropagation. I don't think it's how the brain works. We clearly don't need all the labeled data. My view is throw it all away and start over. I would claim we don't have to start over because these problems were solved in the 1970s and 1980s. In particular, in the first issue of the journal Neural Networks in 1988, I had an article that listed 17 problems of backpropagation that are overcome by adaptive resonance. And here they are. With regard to not needing all the label data, I noted in the third item here that self-organized, unsupervised or supervised learning frees us from needing labels all the time. As to slow learning, I noted that in art you can have fast or slow learning. Indeed, art can learn to classify an entire database using fast learning on a single learning trial 
as Gail Carpenter and I showed in the 1980s. Moreover, auto overcomes all 17 problems of backpropagation without ex epicycles. Furthermore, <coughs> all the core art predictions have been supported by subsequent psychological and neurobiological data. Indeed, art is a principled biological and technological theory, unlike backprop and deep learning, which are just algorithms. Art has explained data from hundreds of experiments, and it's made scores of predictions that have subsequently received experimental support. Well, why has art been so successful? There are a number of reasons, but one of them is that art can be derived from a thought experiment about a universal problem in error correction that I published 40 years ago in Psychological Review. The thought experiment asks the question, how can a coding error be corrected if no individual cell knows that one has occurred? Let me quote from my paper. The importance of this issue becomes clear when we realize that erroneous cues can accidentally be incorporated into a code when our interactions with the environment is simple and will only become evident when our environmental expectations become more demanding. And even if our code perfectly matched a given environment, we would certainly make errors as the environment itself fluctuates. So I was talking about autonomous local learning in a changing world. A purely logical inquiry into error correction is translated at every step of the thought experiment into processes learning autonomously in real time with only locally computed quantities. Moreover, the thought experiment uses familiar environmental facts about how we learn as its hypotheses and art circuits naturally emerge, where these facts are familiar because they're, they're ubiquitous environmental constraints on the evolution of our brains. And since we're living with them all the time, they become familiar. Because of this universality, art circuits may thus in some form be embodied in all future truly autonomous adaptive intelligent devices whether biological or artificial. <coughs> Art has probably for this reason already been used in many large-scale engineering and technological applications. In fact, almost immediately after Art was introduced, it began being used because it succeeded in benchmark studies against machine learning, backpropagation, statistical methods, genetic algorithms either getting much better accuracy or much faster training speed or both. It's also used in applications where other algorithms totally fail, such as the Boeing company's part design, reuse, and inventory compression uh, application. That's just one of many large-scale applications in engineering and technology some of which can be found on our tech lab webpage at bu.edu. The Boeing parts design retrieval system in particular was used to help design the Boeing 777. And to do that, you needed fast learning and stable memory to learn and search a huge and continually growing non-stationary parts inventory. At the time of this application, there are already 16 million one million dimensional vectors that were used to describe each of the parts and you had to be able to quickly search the inventory if you wanted to find a part to use in a new plane especially if your new design might have a part in the inventory that was similar to it finding it and slightly modifying design could save millions of dollars in fabrication costs Satellite remote sensing is another large scale application that ARC was used for very soon. And Gail Carpenter and her colleagues took the lead here. For example, 
using a very small number of pixels of ground truth of 17 vegetation classes, they used art to automatically complete uh, these um, uh, maps you, uh, uh, using remote sensing data. Art did it in a day, rapidly and automatically. It gave a confidence map for each pixel, and the pixels were 30 meters in scale, which was small enough to see roads. This contrasted with an AI expert system, which took a whole year to do it, and it had to derive ad hoc ad hoc rules from experts. You had to correct up, upwards of a quarter of a million site labels. And even so, the pixel size was an order of magnitude larger. Gail went on with her colleagues to study information fusion in remote sensing. Let's say you have multiple observers. Each of them may be using different labels. The labels may also be incomplete or missing or even incorrect. And the task was to derive consistent knowledge from potentially inconsistent data to automatically learn and stably store one to many mappings. And along the way, Gail and a colleague showed how to self-organize a hierarchy of cognitive rules, including confidence measures between these different levels of the hierarchy. There's been continual work on art. Some more recent work was summarized in a special issue of Neural Networks just in, that, in December 2019 that was edited by Donald Bunch, who started the special issue with a general overview of neural network models that I and my colleagues developed, and then went on in a long and detailed article with several collaborators to provide a survey of adaptive resonance theory neural network models for engineering applications to the present time. So back propagation and deep learning are a feed forward adaptive filter, but art is more than that. In fact, art is an explainable, self-organizing production system in a non-stationary world. What do these words mean? Or it's self-organizing because it can autonomously carry out arbitrary combinations of unsupervised or supervised learning trials with the world as its only teacher. It's a production system because it uses hypothesis testing to discover and learn rules by a top-down matching process that focuses attention on critical feature patterns. These are the patterns that predict behavioral success while suppressing irrelevant features. Art's explainable using both its activities or short-term memory STM traces and its adaptive weights or long-term memory LTM traces. Activation dynamics, learning dynamics. Observing the STM traces in a critical feature pattern explain what recognition categories will learn to code and what features predict goal-oriented actions. In particular, the long-term memory traces in the fuzzy art map algorithm translate into explicit fuzzy if-then rules that code what combinations of critical features in what numerical ranges effectively control predictions thereby illustrating one of many examples where neural networks can learn rule-based behaviors. Art includes a bottom-up adaptive filter of feed-forward neural network, as I've observed already, but that's supplemented by top-down learned expectations and two types of recurrent inhibitory feedback interactions that help to choose the recognition categories and the critical features. Notably, top-down expectations use what Gail Carpenter and I call the art matching rule to learn how to focus attention on critical features that control predictive success. The art matching rule is another way of talking computationally about the process of object attention, how we pay attention to 
salient objects in the world. And we show how it stabilizes learning and thereby avoids catastrophic forgetting. Remarkably, and this has been supported by many data, <coughs> uh, the art matching rule can be realized by a top-down modulatory on center off surround network. Well, what does this mean? Well, let's say we have bottom up inputs from external features to feature selective cells that get stored in short term memory. Let's say we activate a recognition category, which has previously been learned and it tries to read out its learned excitatory prototype. Well, it can't fully do so because it also reads out an inhibitory off surround that's broader than the prototype. And so this is approximately one excitatory against one's inhibitory. It can only give you a modulatory on center. But if you have both bottom up inputs and the top down expectation simultaneously active, then within the bounds of the prototype, if you also have a bottom-up feature, you have two excitatory against one inhibitory, and those features can be selected, gain amplified, and synchronized to start focusing attention on this critical feature pattern, while outlier features, the ones that aren't within the prototype, only have one excitation against one inhibition, are suppressed. And in 1999, I was able to begin to understand how laminar cortical circuits carry out object detention, in particular, layer six of a higher cortical area can activate layer six of a lower cortical area, either directly or via layer five. And then uh, it can fold up to layer four to modulate an on center and to inhibit an off surround. So attention acts via a top-down modulatory on center off surround network via folded feedback within lamina neocortex. And this is one example of the paradigm of lamina computing that I introduced, which asks why are all neocortical circuits organized in layers and how do laminar circuits give rise to all kinds of biological intelligence? Adaptive resonance enters the story because attended feature clusters reactivate their bottom up pathways. Activated categories reactivate their top down pathways, closing an excitatory feedback loop between features and categories, giving rise to a feature category resonance that synchronizes, amplifies, and prolongs system response between the attended critical features and the uh, category to which they are bound. And it's this resonance that triggers fast learning in the bottom up and top down adaptive weights, which is why I have called the theory adaptive resonance theory. Moreover, I've done a lot of work since then showing that all conscious states are resonance states and these feature category resonances are one example of that, one that supports conscious recognition of visual objects and scenes. There's a lot of data support for art predictions. It's well known that attention does have an on center off surround uh, circuit behind it and that attention can facilitate matched bottom-up signals, many other data as well. So now we can say more about why art is explainable or trustworthy. In short-term memory, it's because the critical feature patterns determine the attentional focus that controls information processing, and you can just read off what those features are. In long-term memory, again, it's the critical feature patterns that determine the adaptive weights learned by the bottom-up adaptive filter and the top-down learned expectation. So you know also what these weights are encoding. Art's reliable and avoids catastrophic forgetting because outlier features that are not in the critical feature pattern are suppressed. 
so that only the predictive features are processed and coded. Or it's a production system because it carries out a kind of hypothesis testing. And this is nicely illustrated in the simplest art model called ART1 that Gail Carpenter and I published in 1987. ART1 has an attentional system that does all the category learning and the expectation learning and the paying of attention that interacts with an orienting system, which is activated when there are big enough matches in the attentional system and thereby drives a reset and search for novel or better matching categories. Here's a schematic of the art hypothesis testing and learning cycle. So let's say you have a bottom-up feature pattern coming in. There may be many, many active bottom-up features, but I'll draw just one arrow here for simplicity. But that vector of input features can activate a distributed pattern of feature detector cells. Some may be very active, some not so active, some not active at all. And as this is happening, each of these active pathways is trying to turn on the orienting system. So there might be quite a few inputs converging here, but as the features are activated, each of them tries to inhibit the orienting system. And there are as many features as there are inputs. So this excitation inhibition of balance, keeping the orienting system quiet as the feature pattern goes to the adaptive filter and chooses a category. That category reads out a learned top-down expectation that obeys the art matching rule, which can suppress some mismatch features, thereby reducing the amount of inhibition on the orienting system and raising the question, when you have too little inhibition and too much excitation, how big a mismatch will activate the orienting system and cause reset? And that um, <coughs> ratio is determined by what's called vigilance, which I'll say more about soon. But if you don't have enough inhibition, then the orienting system gets activated. It equally activates all the cells in the category layer because it doesn't know which cell may be active or not. So it causes a novelty uh, sensitive non-specific burst of arousal, novel events are arousing, thereby selectively shutting off the active category, eliminating its top-down expectation, and unmasking the original feature pattern, which can again go through the adaptive filter. However, now this uh, previously disconfirmed category remains off, and the category level is renormalized, so it responds to the same input pattern with a new category. And you go through this cycle of resonance and reset until you get a good enough match to either learn a new category or select a previously learned category. And it's a theorem that as categories are learned through this matching process, search automatically disengages, <coughs> leading to direct access without search to the globally best matching category. Explaining, for example, how we can quickly recognize familiar objects like your mother's face, even if as we get older, we store enormous numbers of additional memories. So you don't have to search your whole repertoire. When you see mom, you get direct access and quickly say, Hi, mom. There's a lot of support for the hypothesis testing cycle. One source of support is from event related potentials, also called human scalp potentials, which shows correlated sequences of three different evoked potentials during oddball learning tasks, an experiment that John Paul Banquet and I reported in the 80s, where you'll get a P120 for a mismatch and N200 for the arousal activated by the orienting system, and a P300 for the short-term memory reset of the category layer, thereby supporting the processing stages of the search cycle. There was also physiological data 
from infratemporal cortex where categories are learned early on from the lab of Bob Desimone who showed an active matching process that's reset between trials during this kind of event. There's also classical data about hippocampal mismatch dynamics. It's known that novelty potentials subside as learning proceeds from numerous experiments. This is as the orienting system is disengaged. And there's more recent data using multiple electrode studies from the lab of Earl Miller from prefrontal cortex and simultaneous recordings in a hippocampus. And they show there's rapid object associative learning may occur in prefrontal cortex, which is a projection of infratemporal cortex, one of the stages of category learning. While the hippocampus may guide neocortical plasticity for by signaling success or failure. Well, this is just what happens when the attentional system interacts with the orienting system. There's also complementary computing in art. In particular, the attentional and orienting system was a complementary as manifested by the fact that two event-related potentials are complementary, processing negativity and N200. Processing negativity is activated when there's a top-down match in the attentional system. The N200, as I just noted, is activated when there's a mismatch that activates the orienting system. And you can just look across these four rows and see that these two um, kinds of ERP potentials are manifestly complementary as illustrated the complementarity of the attentional and orienting systems. So this leads us to discuss another paradigm introduced, which I call complementary computing, that asks what is the nature of brain specialization? Complementary computing introduces new principles of uncertainty and complementarity that clarify why there are multiple parallel processing streams with multiple processing stages in our brains. And a beautiful example of that is this famous image of the macro circuit of the visual system from David Van Essen and his colleagues, where you can see these multiple uh, parallel processing streams and the multiple uh, stages needed to achieve what I call hierarchical resolution of uncertainty. But what are complement complementary properties? There are analogies like a key fits into a lock or puzzle pieces fitting together. In words, computing one set of properties at a processing stage prevents that stage from computing a complementary set of properties. These complementary parallel processing streams are balanced against one another. It's a very yin yang kind of situation and interactions between the streams overcome their complementary weaknesses. In fact, there are many complementary processes that are known in the brain that have been modeled. Here is just five of them. There are many more. So this is a basic principle of brain organization. So in summary so far, backpropagation and deep learning do not have short to memory activation patterns, including critical feature patterns so they can't pay attention. Indeed, they don't have any fast information processing, nor do they have long-term memory top-down learned expectations, so they can't carry out hypothesis testing using interactions, short-term and long-term memory traces. Indeed, there's no neural architecture, there's just an algorithm in this really great contrast with complementary computing, which discusses the global organization of our brains. From the very start, it was shown how easy it is to get catastrophic forgetting, and Carpenter and I showed it in art when we would shut down the art matching rule. Then we demonstrated you could get catastrophic forgetting if you had just four input vectors, A, B, C, D, presented in the order A, B, C, A, D, A, B, C, A, D, and so on. 
if they obeyed very simple subset relationships. And here's a computer simulation of that. Here you don't have the art matching rule. Here's A, B, C, A, D, A, B, C, A, D. And you see A is coded by category one here, by category two here, by category one here, two here, it never settles down. But as soon as you impose the art matching rule, learning is complete by the second trial. And after that point, you get direct access to the globally best matching category. Well, let's say a little more about vigilance. Vigilance determines what features are learned in the critical feature pattern. It clarifies how our brains learn concrete knowledge for some tests and abstract knowledge for others. So in particular, high vigilance leads to learning of narrow concrete categories, like a category that fires selectively to a frontal view of your mother's face. Low vigilance leads to learning of broad and abstract categories, like everyone has a face. It should be emphasized that critical feature patterns are explainable at every level of vigilance. It's known <coughs> from physiological experiments by Desimone again, that their vigilance um, control in the infratemporal cortex, which they showed by studying easy versus difficult discriminations in monkeys. And in the difficult condition, which you'd assume would give you high vigilance, as expected, you had enhancement of the responses and sharpened selectivity to the attended stimuli. How is vigilance computed? Well, let's say you have input vector. It instates a, a vector of activities and feature detectors at the same time as it tries to activate the earning system but it does, does so multiplied by a parameter rho, which is a sensitivity or game parameter, that's vigilance. And as these features get in state, they try to shut off the orienting system. And if the excitation is less than the inhibition, the orienting system stays quiet, so the system can resonate and learn. But if inhibition isn't strong enough, the orienting system gets activated, you get reset and search for new categories. This is a very simple computation because you have an orienting system that's complementary to the attentional system. Well, how do you change vigilance based on predictive success? For this, we have to go from unsupervised to supervised art models. So we'll have an unsupervised art A model, an unsupervised art B model, linked together by a learned associative map as occurs in fuzzy art map. And a key point is you can have an input here that can create an output there because you have both bottom up and top down connections at all these levels. So in this way, you can learn many to one and one to many maps. One example of a many-to-one map is, let's say you're trying to categorize visually processed a letter A, which comes in multiple fonts. You'll learn various visual categories of A based on visual similarity. At the same time, you're learning auditory categories for saying A, and then the associative map can map all of these visual categories of different A's to saying A. But it could have been here that these inputs were symptoms, tests, and treatments in a medical database prediction uh, example, and you're predicting length of stay of the hospital. The possibilities here are endless, and there have been many applications. Or let's say <clears throat> <coughs> you're trying to figure out what this image is, and you've learned to say, that's a dog, but today you say it's Rover, and that causes a mismatch which drives the search to focus attention on the particular combination of features in this dog that will identify it as Rover. That leads to learning of a visual category of Rover, the, an auditory category for the name Rover, 
an associative map between them, and you can now simultaneously store expert knowledge about that image. Well, how do you conjointly minimize predictive error and maximize generalization so that you minimize uh, using um, memory resources? Let me read you an answer and then show what it means in images. Match tracking realizes a minimax learning principle, namely given a predictive error, vigilance increases just enough to trigger search and thus sacrifices the minimum generalization to correct the error. So let's say you've made a prediction that must mean that vigilance is less than the analog match between bottom up and top down. But let's say now you have a mismatch. Well, that'll lead to a match tracking signal that bumps vigilance up till it's just above the analog match, just big enough to drive the search. So you've given up the minimum amount of generalization to correct the error. Well, our art mechanisms like vigilance control realized in lamina, cortical and thalamic circuits, the answer is yes. My PhD student Max Versace and I showed this by developing the synchronous matching art or SMART model, which introduced a lot more neurophysiological and anatomical verisimilitude into the model, including spiking dynamics, lamina cortical circuits interacting with specific and non-specific thalamic nuclei. This is another example of lamina computing. And here's a schematic of the model. You see all the cortical layers with identified cells, a hierarchy of cortical regions interacting with specific thalamic nuclei and non-specific thalamic nuclei. A ton of anatomical data got functionally explained in this way, and many other data as well. For example, we showed if you have a good enough match between bottom up and top down, you're going to get fast gamma oscillations during attention. There was quite a bit of data about that already, but we also showed if you have a big enough mismatch, you'll get slower beta oscillations. That wasn't well known. But since that time, there have been experiments in at least four labs in three different parts of the brain confirming that prediction. Most important vigilance control was shown how to be uh, controlled by mismatch mediated acetylcholine release, a big enough mismatch in the nonspecific thalamic nucleus activates nucleus basalis of minor that uh, releases acetylcholine in layer five cells across the cortex, reducing after hyperpolarization currents and causing vigilance to go up. And I also showed that breakdowns in acetylcholine modulation can help to explain the symptoms of multiple mental disorders. So as to memory consolidation, we know there's a dynamic phase of memory consolidation while the input exemplar still drives memory search and before direct access occurs. But what if the orienting system's cut out? What if you have a lesion in the hippocampus? Well then, as occurs in medial temporal amnesia, you get unlimited anterograde amnesia because you can't search for new categories. You get limited retrograde amnesia because you could have direct access to previously learned categories. This is a failure of consolidation, which is mediated by the orientating system. You get defective novelty reactions because that is also mediated by the orienting system. And memory consolidation novelty detection are mediated by the same structures for the same reason. There's normal priming because priming occurs within the attentional system. Learning of the first item dominates. You can get some learning, but you can't then search. And there's an impaired ability to attend to relevant dimensions of stimuli, again, because you can't search. So now, where does intratemporal cortex fit in within the larger brain? I introduced the predictive art or part algorithm uh, a model 
in order to show how the prefrontal cortex, among other things, learns to control all higher order intelligence. You can find that in a 2018 paper on my webpage. I also published it open access. <coughs> and in this macro circuit, these green areas of prefrontal cortex control processes like working memory, learned plans, prediction, optimized action. These regions in red control processes like reinforcement learning, emotion, motivation, adaptively timed learning. The category learning I've talked about in IT is just in those two regions. All these processes uh, control visual perception. And there are detailed models of all of these regions and their interactions now. And each brain region in nature and in predictive art carries out a different function, contrasting really dramatically with the homogeneous organization of a typical deep learning network. So I've told you just a little bit about some aspects of cognition and why they're explainable. But if you put in all the biological models of perceptual cognition, emotion, and action, they're all explainable. And then you can assert how perceptual and cognitive processes use art like excitatory matching and match-based learning to create self-stabilizing, attentive and conscious representations of objects and events that embody increasing expertise about the world. Moreover, complementary spatial and motor processes that I couldn't mention at all use inhibitory matching and mismatch-based learning to continually update spatial and motor representations to compensate for bodily changes throughout life. Taken together, they provide a self-stabilizing perceptual and cognitive front end for conscious awareness and knowledge acquisition, which can intelligently manipulate the more labile spatial and motor processes that enable our changing bodies to act effectively on a changing world. And when you put them all together, they provide a blueprint for designing autonomous adaptive algorithms and mobile robots with behaviors humans can understand and control because they're both explainable and reliable. See my webpage, sites.bu.edu, uh, Steve G for these um, um, models. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. So thank you very much for that excellent presentation. We have many questions, so I would say that we should go directly towards them. Um, let us start. Um, Professor Grossberg, it's so great to hear your overview. I remember your work from the late 70s, 80s, at a time when it seemed that the field of machine learning was still open to a more diverse set of techniques. Maybe that perspective is wrong, but I'm wondering if you can comment on why algorithms and systems like art and others that are not back prop deep learning architectures perhaps have tended to attract less attention in machine learning currently. Well, <clears throat> That's a good question. On the one hand, my answer is yes and no. For example, um, my work has been cited around 85,000 times, which shows some interest. Moreover, art has been used in many large scale applications that deep learning cannot carry out. Uh, many of them require fast incremental autonomous learning and prediction in a non-stationary data environment. But I also think part of the reason is that deep learning, like my last slide of uh, uh, layers of deep learning showed, is 
conceptually very simple. It's just steepest descent, which is a concept that goes back to Friedrich Gauss hundreds of years ago. Art is an, a model. It's an architecture. You need to spend a little time thinking about things like attention versus orientation. These are concepts that go way back in the history of psychobiology. And I use attention and orienting to honor these great psychobiologists. But of course, I explained what they meant by embodying them in precise mathematical and architectural form. And secondly, I work like a dog. If you look at my webpage, you'll see over 560 articles on just about every aspect of how our brains make our minds. A number of the people involved in the deep learning community spend most of their time marketing over and over and over again. And I think there's nothing wrong with marketing. Look, I give keynote lectures all over the world. That's what we do, we try to teach. But I also give a comparative discussion of other models so people know what the strengths and weaknesses are of the models I have to offer relative to others. I have not seen that at all in the deep learning community. I think it's a great failure. So if you market your product over and over again and don't let people who don't know the literature that, hey, there are really useful alternatives, this can happen. And I won't name names, but if you know what I'm talking about, you know who I'm talking about. Okay, very honest answer. So I will move on to the next question. Um, maybe one by, um, by Chris Cannon, and then we will come back to the previous question by Martin. So art and art map were the first continual learning algorithms I used back in the early 2000s. While it avoids catastrophic forgetting, this can require setting the vigilance parameter such that art ends up having about as many neurons as samples in the training data set. Since it's it, has as many what? it has as many watts. Uh, well, if everything is high vigilance, you'll have uh, exemplar categories. If you don't use vigilance control, you won't get any compression. If you had very low vigilance, everything would be lumped into one category. So you have to use vigilance control. Without an orienting system, there is no adaptive resonance model. Did you use vigilance control? Maybe Chris, if you would like to comment on the chat on that, follow up on the question. And I just have to say emphatically that art is used in very large scale complex database with great success, but the people who use it know how to use it. Of course, always a central aspect. Should I read the other part of the question? Maybe this will help clarify. The power of deep learning is eliminating feature engineering and learning rich hierarchical features directly from the data. Unless something has it's changed. The power, wait, it's, I'm, there's a lot of echo, I'm sorry. What is the power of oh. deep learning? By the way, as a panelist, you can also open the Q&A panel if it would be more convenient for you and read the question. Um, I'm reading the question by Chris. I Hannah. open Q&A. Do I just yes. touch it? Okay, let me see. Um, uh, let's see, Marty talked about continual learning. I agree. Um, uh, Center Surround isn't just Gabor, Marty. It's it's a uh, shunting uh, on Center of Surround network recurrent that goes beyond Gabor. You have to look at the details. Let's see. It avoids catastrophic forgetting. 
No, you don't set vigilance that high, Chris. That's the problem. The power of deep learning is in eliminating feature engineering. Well, how can you eliminate feature engineering and learn rich hierarchical features? No, no, it's not true what you're writing or can learn deep representations. Um, I just don't agree with what you're writing. I don't think it's technically correct about deep learning, Marty. I, deep learning can't be used at all in a lot of the large scale architectures that art is used in. And you don't comment on the fact that it's unexplainable and unreliable, which to me, or untrustworthy and unreliable, which to me are meta theoretical problems that no detail can fix. You, you can learn receptive fields in art. Of course you can, it's been done long ago. Um, so I think you're just not informed, Marty, I'm sorry. I can copy and paste the questions into the Q&A, that way folks can see them. <clears throat> and we, we don't have that much more time, so are there any other questions? Maybe we could come back if there are no more. I'm happy to do that. I don't want someone not to be able to um, to ask their question. But I, I do want to remark, if you understand the power of the thought experiments that we used to derive not only art as a cognitive model, but COGM as a cognitive emotional model, they both derive from thought experiments whose hypotheses are just familiar facts we all know from daily life. These, these facts don't mention mind and brain. And these models are the unique classes of solutions. There's no getting around that. I mean, if you think about Albert Einstein, who's the greatest of the scientists we know about, he derives special and rel general relativity, both from thought experiments. If you can't find a problem, a logical problem, and if you can't find a problem in the way in which the thought experiment derives art from the hypotheses, then either you really have to believe it or you have to give up your belief in the scientific method. Does that mean that a model like art is complete? No, because there's art one, art two, art two A, art three, fuzzy art, fuzzy art map. So for effective computational applications, first, you always have to have pre-processing. If you look at how our brains are designed, let's say visual processing, there's the retina, there's lateral geniculate, there's cortical areas V1, V2, V3, A, V4. Before you ever get to infratemporal cortex, where you start categorizing things, posterior gives you view specific and positionally specific categories, and anterior IT gives you invariant object categories. And so there's a huge amount of pre processing. And so, depending on whether you're working on the factory floor or you're doing climate data or you're doing uh, medical data with very different pre-processing, it might be more efficient to choose one or another art algorithm for your application. And moreover, I, I wouldn't claim that art as the cognitive neural theory is complete. You know, no theory in science is complete. We have to live with the incompleteness. Theoretical physics isn't complete. Super string theory isn't be complete. People are even trying <coughs> to unify general relativity theory with gravitation theory. And Einstein's been dead for a very long time. So none of this is complete. What I hope is if you like some of the things I said, you could look at my magnum opus. It's called Conscious Mind, Resonant Brain. 
how each brain makes a mind. It's very cheap because I subsidized it so everyone could afford it. 15 bucks on Kindle. It'll give you an overview of many aspects of how our brains make our minds in both healthy individuals and clinical patients. And then if you're interested in learning more, if you go to my webpage, sites, S-I-T-E-S W.E.D.U. slash Steve G., there are a very large number of archival articles that go into all of the details <coughs> about many aspects of mind and brain. But are we finished? No, we're never finished. I would be depressed if I thought that there weren't many people who could find some inspiration in my work to get a huge amount of pleasure and interest in their future work. Wonderful. Hey. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, sorry. My pleasure. Yes, thank you so much for that great perspective and all the recommendations. And they, in the interest of time, I will thank you again for joining our conference.